Burnout. In its prime, this once-renowned racing series received much acclaim for its fast-paced racing, numerous cars and maps to choose from, its seemingly unlimited replayability, and last, but of course, definitely not least, its crashes. This racing series, through its addictive, non-stop chaotic gameplay, remains a staple of my childhood and serves as a constant reminder of the countless numbers of hours I didn't spend playing sports or studying, but racing wrecking and unlocking vehicles for my own satisfaction and personal pleasure. From its creation in 2001, its peak in the early to mid 2000s, to its ultimate fate in our memories and PlayStation 2 memory cards, today we'll be looking at the rise and fall of Burnout. The year is 2001. A little movie named The Fast and the Furious is making its way around the world, and video games aiming to capture the magic of high-speed street racing are on the rise. While companies like Rockstar Games develop their own expensive virtual iterations of the underground street racing world, a little-known game developer from Guildford, England was working on their own unique street racing game. Though the company, Criterion Games, already had some experience in the racing genre with titles such as Speedboat Attack, Redline Racer, and Trick Style, the company had yet to see a real hit. After all, they didn't have the biggest budget, and they were relatively new to the gaming industry. On November 1st, 2001, Criterion Games alongside Acclaim Entertainment released Burnout, the first game of their arcade racing franchise. Unlike other street racing console games at the time, the original Burnout felt like it came straight from an arcade cabinet. You had classes with various cars to choose from as well as a multitude of tracks available for four featured game modes, Championship, Survival, Free Run, and Free Run Twin, with Championship being the main focus of the game. Gameplay was quite simple, race your opponents from checkpoint to checkpoint before time runs out. One-on-one -on -one races known as face-offs were also introduced in this game as a means of unlocking your opponent's vehicle. However, this game also had a major twist. In order to succeed, you needed Boost, which is earned by dangerously driving like a drunken jackass. You were awarded with Boost every time you drove on the wrong side of the road, drove near other cars and caused near misses, and essentially drove recklessly without crashing. Because once you crashed, your car would lose boost, which was a major tax towards your progress in the game. If you were able to still drive dangerously at this speed without crashing, you were given another straight shot of boost, otherwise known as a burnout. You see where they were getting at. Compared to future games in the series, the original Burnout is definitely the most difficult. In addition to a much clunkier and harder to control physics engine, crashes would tax your boost level very heavily, making races drastically harder to complete, especially when you're driving at high speeds. Despite its difficulty and primitive PS2 graphics at the beginning of its generation, however, the first game of the Burnout series was praised for its high-speed mayhem and exciting crash animations that made losing at least a bit more satisfying. Quote, Although it's ultimately a bit superficial, Burnout does a good job of capturing the thrill of the chase and the joy of Rex. It's got the racing dynamic of EA's Need for Speed and Acclaim's Test Drive series, but the speed and abandon of Crazy Taxi and Driver. Tom Chick, Planet PS2. Criterion Games had now dipped their toes into new waters, and while it wasn't perfect, Burnout seemed like the game that could propel them to new heights. The moderate success of Burnout thus led to a sequel, once again developed by Criterion Games and published by Acclaim Entertainment. The game was Burnout 2 Point of Impact, released on September 30th, 2002 for the PlayStation 2, and later on the GameCube and Xbox, and as the name suggests, the game looked to further capitalize on its spectacular crash system. It's safe to say Acclaim Entertainment was excited about this game's release, as the company even offered to pay for speeding tickets issued in the United Kingdom as a way to promote the game. The idea was rejected by the UK government, and it's really not difficult to see why. In addition to the game modes present in the original Burnout game, Burnout 2 Point of Impact also introduced Pursuit Mode, where players in cop cars must chase after an opponent's car and arrest a driver thus unlocking their vehicle, as well as point-to-point -point mode, which was essentially a sprint from point A to point B. 
However, most importantly, the game included Crash Mode, a new, more or less strategy-based mode that challenged players to perfectly crash into a junction full of cars in order to generate the most damage possible. Not much has to be said about Burnout 2. It succeeded in adding depth with the addition of these new modes, as well as new cars and tracks and graphics that significantly improved since the first game. This is especially true in the Xbox version of the game, which included 21 new custom car skins, as well as 15 additional junctions to be used in crash mode. It even allowed for Xbox Live leaderboard connectivity. Like its predecessor, Burnout 2 received generally favorable reviews, with many critics applauding the game for its graphics, gameplay, and significant improvement from the first installment. Quote, Burnout 2 is the most fun driving game on the PS2. If Gran Turismo 3 is Don Perignon, Burnout 2 is Jack Daniels. While Dom may be a great guy, personally, I'd rather hang out with Jack. Either way, Burnout 2 deserves a spot on every PS2 owner's shelf. Kevin Murphy, Game Spy. The series was now gaining ground as players eagerly anticipated the next installment of the Burnout series. However, the road to Burnout 3 wouldn't be so easy. In 2002, Criterion entered talks with the video game giant Electronic Arts to allow them to develop a remake of the 1988 skateboarding classic Skate or Die. At the same time, Criterion was also busy pitching their concept of a stunt-based Need for Speed game that would be titled Need for Speed Split Second. However, as exciting as these plans were for Criterion, neither of them would be realized. Criterion felt as if EA had been taking away the creative power from their developers, and thus withdrew from the Skate or Die project. This then severed ties with EA, and it thus eliminated their proposed Need for Speed title. It was clear, however, that this failed relationship didn't sit well with Bruce McMillian, executive VP at EA Worldwide Studios. He took it upon himself to take action, which he did at E3 2003. Alex Ward, director of design at Criterion Games, was approached by McMillian, who offered Ward the opportunity to once again work with EA. Despite his initial reluctance and intention to wait until the next console generation to create a new Burnout game, Ward accepted and took the opportunity to work with EA, this time for the next installment of the Burnout series. Production soon began, and in July 2004, Electronic Arts announced their acquisition of Criterion Games, as well as their purchase of the rights to Burnout from the struggling Acclaim Entertainment. Thanks to their new, stronger relationship with Electronic Arts, as well as their past success with the previous two Burnout games, the stage was set for Criterion Games to once again create and innovate with their next title. EA now granted them creative control, and thus a new era had begun. On September 8, 2004, Burnout 3 Takedown was released for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox. And dear god, was this an amazing game. With a fully stacked soundtrack of licensed songs, graphics that were light years better than the games before it, as well as a myriad of new and exciting cars, tracks, and game modes, Burnout 3 Takedown didn't take long to prove itself to the gaming world. Everything about this game seemed better than its predecessors, from its physics, depth, graphics, and overall gameplay design. The game also contained various events such as races, time attacks known as burning laps, crash mode, eliminator races, grand prix races, as well as a multitude of multiplayer party modes. However, the most important addition of this game would be Road Rage, a mode that single-handedly turned Burnout from a dangerous driving game to a game of vehicular warfare. The objective of the game was quite simple wreck all of the opposing drivers to score takedowns, and keep yourself alive. You wreck them in any way possible, using walls, shunts, other cars, and your boots to take them out. To this day, Road Rage is still my favorite game in all Burnout games. It's non-stop addictive action, and you can't just play it once. These modes were then combined into World Tour mode, which was the primary championship mode that allowed you to unlock even more tracks, more cars, trophies, and other unlockables in the game. Burnout 3 was the perfect arcade racer. It combined difficulty and precision with excitement and reckless intent. It was easy enough to pick up and play, but difficult enough to constantly keep you at the edge of your seat. 
crash animations were much more detailed, and you were even able to control the motion of your crashing car to take down other drivers even as your car came to a screeching halt. You now had access to your boost at any time. You didn't need to wait for the meter to build up, and it was expandable as you earned more throughout an event. Burnout 3 is often regarded not only as the best game of the series, but as one of the best arcade racing games to have ever been released. Ever. And it's a shame we still haven't seen a remastered edition nearly two decades later. It received higher ratings than ever all across the board. Praised for its addictive gameplay, high speed immersion, numerous game modes, and satisfying crash animations. Quote, with incredibly realistic damage modeling transforming every crash into a work of art fit to be framed and hung on the walls of Paris' Louvre Museum. Burnout 3 is a visual dynamo that will floor players with its speed and gorgeous vistas. Game Informer Magazine, October 2004. It's safe to say EA really hit one out of the park with Criterion Games. In one game together, they essentially set the standards for their new genre gave fans of the series more than they could have asked for, and reeled in new fans from around the world to their series like Fish on a Hook. The future of both Criterion Games and the Burnout series undoubtedly looked as bright as ever. The next installment in the Burnout franchise came in September of 2005 with Burnout Revenge, released on the same day as its handheld counterpart, Burnout Legends. Released for the PlayStation 2, Xbox, and Xbox 360, Burnout Revenge was the first Burnout game to be released for a 7th generation console, and man did they make a great entrance. Packed with new races, new tracks, new cars, and online gameplay even for the PlayStation 2, Burnout Revenge did a great job following up the success of Burnout 3 Takedown. In addition to the series' previous game modes, Revenge also included Traffic Attack and Crash Breaker modes. Traffic Attack was an interesting one, as players essentially drive into traffic and cause as much mayhem as possible. But instead of the typical chain reaction junction crashes we were used to, we actually drove through traffic. Provided a traffic car was driving in the same direction as a player and smaller than a delivery truck, they could be launched like missiles when you hit them. This concept was also added to regular events, allowing players to score traffic check takedowns when a vehicle was launched in the path of an opponent driver. Crash Breaker events were essentially regular events with a badass twist. When you crashed, you had the option of utilizing Crash Breaker, usually used in crash mode, to detonate your vehicle and score takedowns in addition to aftertouch takedowns. The Xbox 360 version of the game was also hugely improved, with enhanced online features like shareable replays as well as Revenge Rivals, a system that kept track of how many times you were taken out by another online player. It also contained 10 new crash junctions, not to mention graphics that were dramatically better than its 6th generation counterparts. Revenge also took advantage of downloadable content, both in the forms of Xbox Live downloads and in kiosk downloads, which were made available to players who would bring their Xbox 360 memory units to participating shops like GameStop and have cars loaded onto them. As expected, the game also had amazing reviews, receiving a 90 on Metacritic, living up to expectations many had after the release of its iconic predecessor. Burnout Revenge proves once again why it is the ultimate spectacle for those of us who just want to feel the rush. You know you're playing a great game when even the pauses in the action are filled with rockin' music, flashy video, and big sound effects. Jim Schaefer, Detroit Free Press. While Burnout Revenge was certainly not as innovative or game-changing as the installment before it, it was undoubtedly a great game that not only brought the series to the next generation, but lived up to the magic that was expected of it. Criterion's next project in the Burnout series came in the form of the first and only handheld Burnout exclusive, Burnout Legends for the Sony PSP and Nintendo DS, released on the same day as Burnout Revenge. Now, to say that there's a distinct difference between the two versions of this game would be a pretty huge understatement. In short, the games were night and day. While the PSP version of Legends was met with high acclaim and lived up to its expectations as a perfect handheld version of Burnout, complete with its decent graphics, many of the same game modes, maps, and vehicles, the Nintendo DS version of the game didn't receive nearly as much recognition. Yes, everyone knows the DS already had inferior hardware, but that's still no excuse for this game almost feeling like it came out for the Genesis. 
While the PSP version felt much more like a handheld version of Takedown, the DS version excluded a licensed soundtrack and was simply lacking in graphics as well as crash animations, the latter being one of the most important pieces of Burnout as a whole. However, for a device that is widely considered as underpowered, especially when compared to the PSP at the time, I have to say its inclusion of major Burnout modes is pretty impressive. And before you guys say, oh my god, how are you supposed to get mad at DS graphics when all of them are bad? Take a look for yourself, these were bad. However, if you lower your expectations for this game on the DS, you still have a pretty fun racing game. Overall, Legends more or less succeeded in bringing the Burnout experience to the handheld consoles, and it was a great way to extend the experience to players who were on the go. While Criterion Games shifted their focus towards a much larger Burnout game for the next generation, the final Burnout installment for the PlayStation 2 and PSP was released on March 6, 2007 with the title Burnout Dominator, developed by Electronic Arts UK. This title in the Burnout franchise shifted its focus back to the racing scene, reintroducing Burnouts and Burnout Chains as major components of the racing experience. Several cars were both added and brought back to this game, as it introduced new vehicle categories including Class, Factory, Tuned, Hot Rod, Super, Race Specials, and Dominator. While some modes and features were absent in this game, including traffic checking and traffic attack mode, as well as the famous crash mode, Dominator introduced a plethora of new modes that basically scored you on stunts, drifts, near misses, or the amount of burnouts that you get. There was also Record Breaker mode, which essentially allowed players to set high scores for races, road rages, and time attacks without being forced to stick with one event or car series. Its locations, like past games, were heavily inspired by real-world locations, and is cited as being one of the first games to ever really try to recreate the city of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. The game was also ported very well to the PSP, even including two downloadable tracks from the game's Burnout HQ, and featuring similarly impressive graphics and an overall enjoyable experience. The title for both systems received generally favorable reviews, though its critical reception feigned in comparison with its predecessors with the lowest Metacritic scores since the first game. While the game took a slightly different approach to the proven Burnout formula, what it did best was combining the magic of later Burnout games with the boost system from Point of Impact. However, Dominator can be considered to be more of a spin-off rather than a true sequel to the franchise. After all, Criterion wasn't even the studio behind the development of the title. You can't take away the fact that this game is fast, fun, and a bit more challenging, but it didn't do too much to improve on Burnout's wrecking and racing fundamentals. Quote, a fun and addicting arcade racing game that fans of the series will enjoy. It's just missing some key features that would make it one of the series' best. For that, we'll have to wait for the true sequel later this year, Gamer's Temple. And for fans of the Burnout franchise, we all knew what this true sequel came to be. On January 22, 2008, Criterion Games and Electronic Arts released one of the most remembered and recognizable titles in their famous franchise with the title Burnout Paradise for the PC, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360. This game presented undoubtedly the biggest change to the Burnout franchise, with its vast open world setting in the fictional Paradise City. On a personal note, I remember a time as a child when this game was the most amazing racing title I had ever seen. I distinctly remember amassing a small crowd of squeaky voiced children watching me play the demo version of this game on a PlayStation 3 kiosk in a GameStop, and getting kicked out as we all cheered at the sight of my car virtually disintegrating as it slammed into a wall at full speed. Yes. This title in the Burnout franchise definitely set the bar for crash animations, more on this later, and while I know I may now come off as very biased, its gameplay was certainly astounding and is still very replayable. As opposed to all of its predecessors, Paradise no longer relied on a menu-based race selection system. Rather, you would drive around and find events to complete. Once that event was discovered, it would appear on both your mini-map and pause menu map. 
instead of just selecting the event you wanted to participate in, players would approach stoplights that contained the event they wanted to play, and they initiated the event by holding down the brake and gas pedal at the same time. Events in the game included race, road rage, new events including stunt run, marked man, multiplayer cops and robbers, as well as burning route, a time trial event that allowed players to unlock enhanced versions of their already unlocked cars. Crash mode also returned, but in a much different way, as players were allowed to enter showtime mode and cause mayhem at any time in any part of the map they chose. Time world rules were also introduced as a way to compete with online players for the fastest time at certain parts of Paradise City. As players won more events, they would earn licenses, and new cars would appear on the map that could be unlocked once the player takes them down in free roam. I remember just driving around this game's online world with other players scoring takedowns against each other as we free roamed. The game presented tons of content, as well as DLC that kept the game alive and well. One of these DLCs even contained an entirely new free roam expansion map called Big Surf Island. As much as we may look down on DLCs, especially from EA today, I really have to admit that much of this game's DLCs were worth it, and most are available for no extra cost in the game's 2018 remaster. Because of the game's drastic changes from its original formula, however, as well as the decision to eliminate features like GPS waypoints and instant event restarts, as well as opposition towards the game's DJ, DJ Atomica. The game still received some mixed, but generally extremely positive reviews, even to this day. For the time, its visuals were particularly breathtaking. It was an easy game to pick up and play for hours, and its world was very much worth exploring. And as I said earlier, its crash animations were second to none. Quote, these minor hitches notwithstanding, Burnout Paradise is an excellent solid ride for both solo and online gamers, with superb control, high production values, complete freedom, and so much obsessive, secret hunting, gotta catch em all, lasting gameplay incentive that it's almost ridiculous. Game Revolution With all things said, this game looked to be another great addition to the Burnout franchise and possibly even a new start as we approach the next decade. However, that would be it. With the exception of the fun little arcade game Burnout Crash and the 2018 remaster of Burnout Paradise, it's been over 10 years since the last real entry to the Burnout series, which leads most to ask, what killed Burnout? Well, first of all, we have to realize EA is a business. It's a firm, and firms have expectations for each and every one of their products. The Burnout series just happens to be one of them. Sure, in many of our eyes, Burnout was doing well receiving pretty great reviews and making numbers in terms of sales. However, it doesn't take a keen eye to realize Burnout had never reached the brand recognition received by EA's other arcade racing series, Need for Speed. See, by 2008, EA was pumping money into three different racing brands, the EA Sports NASCAR series, Need for Speed, and of course, Burnout. With NASCAR sales slumping and Burnout failing to reach the popularity and brand recognition of Need for Speed, EA cleared house, and by 2010, Need for Speed would be EA's only major racing series seeing a release. So what about Criterion? Well, Criterion Games would go on to produce Need for Speed Hot Pursuit, which was released in 2010, and the game really seemed to capture the high-speed chaos that was present in Burnout, especially with its brutal crash animations. In 2012, Criterion would also produce Need for Speed Most Wanted a reboot game many see as a spiritual successor to Burnout Paradise, but with real exotic cars, complete with its open world, crash animations, and takedowns, as well as its online multiplayer experience. While critic reviews for both games are mainly positive, it's no surprise that user reviews are generally hit or miss, with many players either loving the Burnout-inspired gameplay or hating Need for Speed's departure from its prime underground days. Since then, Criterion has gone on to produce games like Star Wars Battlefront 2 as well as Burnout Paradise Remastered. They were also slated to release their own extreme sports racing title, but that game would never come to fruition. As gamers, we can choose to see things in many different ways. We can either continue to spite EA for choosing monetary gain over its loyal fans, for choosing not to deliver another Burnout title, for turning away other heavily requested Burnout remasters and we can continue to think about what could have and probably what should have been. Or we can choose to see the glass half full and respect the legacy the Burnout series holds. 
We can be grateful the series ended on a particularly beautiful note, devoid of the excessive cash-grabbing gimmicks of EA, and devoid of all of the loot boxes that plague video games today. We didn't have to sit and write and read about how bad Burnout games were becoming, and how terribly they were devolving. We were able to see Burnout for what it truly represented, fun and badassery. And we were able to create our own memories from its inception on the PlayStation 2, through its prime, and even until today, especially with Paradise Remastered. Ultimately, the choice is yours, but at least there's one thing we can all agree upon. Burnout was, is, and forever will be legendary. This has been a Lost Saint video. Thank you for watching. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you actually watched the video to the whole end, an extra thumbs up to you. Thank you so much. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please let me know if I got something wrong or if there's something that I missed. I will gladly take your criticism. We're about to reach 5,000 views on this channel, which is an extremely small number, but every step feels like a milestone when you're just starting off. So I hope you guys like, comment, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.